welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast. I am delighted to welcome back Steve March Torme to the podcast. He was on the show a little while ago in November of 22, and we talked about his Christmas holiday tour and the importance of music in your life. You were influenced by the Beatles, which and you know influences a lot of people, but. Um, really had a special place in your heart and talked about um, a lot of stuff in that last episode, um, including, you know, your favorite and least favorite parts of the creative process. And you shared some funny stories about touring, which I loved, but we're going to, you know, the second appearance, it's, it's, um, if it could be any more possible, even more relaxed than the first appearance. <laughs> Cause oh, I'll take my shirt off. Okay. Well, you know. <laughs> Pour yourself a cocktail, maybe. And, uh, you know, so we get to dig into some more fun questions since we got some of the other stuff out of the way. But um, tell us a little bit about how things have been going for you in 2023. Well, uh, pretty, pretty good. I mean, no, no major health issues, which is great, which, you know, as people get older, they think about that. But we both know you can have health issues when you're 14. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm happy my Myself, my wife, and my kids were all were all pretty healthy. This is good, so we haven't had to worry about that. Work wise and music wise, it's been really interesting. When you're catching me on a, on a, an extremely interesting weekend coming up, a bunch of things happening. I think we touched last time on the fact that I do I host radio also. Yeah. Since we're a nonprofit uh, independent radio station, we are having one of our pledge drives is starting right now, and those are always challenging for anybody that works in any kind of nonprofit. Uh, atmosphere because you're asking people for money to stay on the air and quite often it's you know it can be unlistenable radio if you've got a radio station you really like and you know they're going through a pledge drive odds are you're going to skip over it you don't want to hear you don't want to be pitched to you don't want to hear and any amount just call so we try to keep it as entertaining as possible so that's like the that's the minor thing that's happening that's going on we just finished a couple of concerts with my my band steam i mentioned them to you before that's a 10-piece cover band we have. So we did a couple of those concerts in the last two weeks. I've got a, a big event coming up on Saturday, uh, the third annual Oshkosh Jazz Festival. And even though Oshkosh is a relatively small town in Wisconsin, this is the third one. There's enough funding for this because we're just lucky. There's a, a friend of mine who runs this, and she has a, a rather wealthy benefactor who contributes to this. So on Saturday, I mean, we've had some some headliners in the two years. It wasn't just, yeah, there's some garage band that plays jazz. We heard of them. The greatest acapella group of all time, Take Six, are going to headline on Saturday, uh, along with a guy named Benny Banak out of New York. He's a, just an excellent, uh, he's a Grammy winner, excellent trumpet player, singer. And I'm doing my Torme Sings Torme tribute with a 10-piece band. So that's going to be great because the, the whole town is closed down. They, they closed down Main Street. And they just flood it with people, and it's a free concert. So there'll be a lot of people there. And the Torme Sings Torme concert is really cool. That's a show that I toured with, that I did a a 32-city tour with. And all the arrangements were written either by myself, my dad, or Marty Page, who was a famous arranger that he worked with. So that's going to be slamming. That's going to be a lot of fun. And I've seen Take Six three times. This will be my fourth time. And they are. there's nobody that sings like them. Nobody has those kinds of arrangements. They are truly unique in that sense. Um, So I think people are in for a real treat. Then I've got a a guy that, uh, it's all over the place, a guy that's connected with me through sports, passed away unexpectedly last year, and there was a golf tournament down near Chicago that these guys would play in called the the Maccabee Golf Tournament. It's for those of us who played in the Maccabee games. It's kind of an alumni thing. Well, since this guy passed away, they've now named it after him. So it's going to be the Fred Cohen Memorial Golf Tournament, and they want me to come down 
and not only play in the tournament, but they want me to play music. They said, you know, the, the last time you were here and we did the golf tournament, remember we all, we found a piano there and you were playing all these songs. We all sang along. I said, oh, really, do we, do we have to do that? And, and they said, no, it would really be fun if you'd come down. So I need to do that on Monday, drive down to Chicago. I'm going to play in the golf tournament. And then afterwards, they're going to have like a montage of all of his stuff. And they want me to play. They want me to do uh, the Beatles in my life, which is a rather sentimental tune. And the, uh, the Eric Clapton song that he wrote after his four-year-old son died, Tears in Heaven. Do you know the song? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So they want me to do that. It's like, oh my God. But I, I can do that. So that's what's going to be on Sunday. Then I come back and there's just more stuff. Oh, I told you about Tumbleweed Connection. Did I mention that to you? I don't recall that one. That's the main project I'm working on. So since we have 45 minutes to talk, I'll get to that later. Ask any other stuff you want, but that that we have to talk about. That's important to me. I'm going to make a note on my sticky notes. That's right, listeners. Now you have to stay to the very end. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that one's worth it. That, that, and that's got a good story behind it. That's pretty Excellent. cool. You always have good stories, Steve. I, I try. <laughs> and if I don't, I make it up. So, you know. <laughs> That's that. That's the spirit. <laughs> then there was the time Magic Johnson called me and said, could you help me with my jump shot? I said, Magic, I'm busy. I said, you know, say what you want and see people go for it. <laughs> well, speaking of sports, um, who are you following these days? Well, it's funny because, well, it's funny, but it's coincidental. I call into a sports, sports talk uh, station on Mondays, uh, usually during the football season. And they started again yesterday. So they're asking me about, uh, all right, so who do you like? Um, let's get to baseball. Who do you, you think is going to win this thing out of the National League? I said, well, they're, they're, the three teams have pulled away from everybody else. I mean, the Atlanta Braves are the best team in baseball this year by far. They're uh, doing great. If, if their pitching holds up, which it should, in even a short series, you know, I think the first one's best of five, and then they go to best of seven. Their pitching holds up. They're going to win it this year. The only two, uh, the only other two teams that have separated themselves are the Houston Astros uh, and the and the LA Dodgers. Any of those three will win the National League. Nobody likes the Astros. We talked about this. Nobody outside of Houston likes the Astros. Nobody. I know. It's the, the cheating scandal didn't help. Yeah, they're no. a little arrogant, but they are that good. They're that good again. Uh, they play great ball for Dusty. Uh, they've got two or three future Hall of Famers on that team. They're going to be a tough out. And the mm -hmm. Dodgers, if they get the pitching, that's going to be a real tough out, too. They've got the second best record in baseball and they're playing great ball. So who do I follow? I just I follow the sport. Mm -hmm. you know, people mm -hmm. here, they, 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 they root for the Brewers, which is nice. And the Brewers probably will be in the playoffs. I just don't know how very far they can go. But I like I like your Astros. They got a shot. We'll yeah yeah i i usually always root for whatever place that i live so i mean like i root for the astros because i'm here but like from an ethical standpoint i don't root for the astros <laughs> just from a geographical standpoint they didn't do themselves any favors with that whole cheating scandal i mean it, it i did they have cameras in center field i think so i think that's what happened that they had they had cameras out in the outfield from center field that were honing in on the catcher's signals Mm. Uh, and, and stealing the signals now baseball has some unwritten rules and has for 100 years there are certain unwritten rules and one of them you know almost kiddingly is if you're not cheating you're not trying uh there are ways to steal a catcher's signs but they don't, they don't go quite as far as having an electronic camera set up you know surreptitiously you know stealing what the catcher's doing that's not cool that's yeah, not cool. yeah. and if you're a batter, you're in the you're in the batter's box, and you're like this, getting ready, and you kind of glance down like this to look at a catcher's signals. The next ball is going to hit you in the, in the in the ribs. They they take care of that. You know the baseball polices itself pretty well. If a pitcher thinks you're you're stealing signs, he's going to plunk you in the ribs with the next pitch, and that takes care of that. But they were getting away with this and banging, you know, their their bats against the roof of the club of the dugout. They got nailed, you know, and they're just they're just not the most likable guys. But yeah, yeah, it is what it is. Understandable. I, as you know, I'm from Kansas City, so I, I'll always root for my Royals all the time. Although they're, they're doing okay. They're not doing great this season. You have a couple of young, good, a couple of good young ball players. Bobby Witt yeah. Jr. is going to be a star. Oh, he's, fantastic! He's got, he's got all the tools. Uh, their pitching staff's terrible. I mean, they just, 
I mean, they're just a, not a good ball club right now. Them, the, the Oakland Athletics, I watched the pitching staffs of both, and they just give up dinger after dinger. They just don't have any real stoppers on those teams. But if if Kansas City drafts well, like they did with Bobby Wood Jr., they can be the uh, Baltimore Orioles in a couple of years. The Orioles were horrible for the last 15 years, and they've got the best record in, in the American League now. They drafted well. they got good young players that have come, come of age. They've got a pitching staff. Isn't this all good music talk for you? Yeah. It is, it is. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's, it's good to uh, discuss all your diff- different interests <laughs> in life. <laughs> but, well, you, you know. City, you got the best team in football, so. True. Oh, the Super Bowl's going to go through them again. I mean, until someone beats Patrick Mahomes and that team, they're the best team in football, period. So That's always nice. It's good to have at least one winning sport in my hometown. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Yes, but yeah, so back to music. I don't think I asked you this question last time, but I'm I'm curious. Do you have a favorite key that you like to play or compose in? Uh, my daughter and I talk about that. B flat and E flat are good keys for singers uh, because the, the overtones just work well. The sus chords, uh, the minor seventh chords in those keys work well. Now, as a piano player and a guitar player, it's a lot easier to write in G, or D or E, they're just easier to play in. But to compose, I get, you know, the truth is I have to learn a lot of stuff that's in different keys. For instance, you know. So those are all, you know, as we call them the black keys, you know, and going from the, well, you're a musician, so you know what I'm talking about but it's a lot easier to do this. <laughs> um, but I don't write songs like that. So yeah, yeah I, I think A flat and E flat, my daughter and I both agree, good, good singers, keys. Most of the stuff I write is, I don't know, D, but I try to, you know, I try to vary the bass notes. Um, that's a, a trick I learned a long time ago. Um, I try, to, I try to teach my little brother that. I said, when you're doing a pattern, and you're going from G to A to D and back to G, maybe the next time through you make it a, a minor seventh. Instead of a G, you're an E minor seventh. It's a more interesting chord. Right? Mm. That's what I think. What do I know? <laughs> the guy who plays baseball. That's, that's... <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, so that's that's yeah, I I, I think those two keys are, are are beautiful for singing. Yeah. Well, it's also, I think easier to sing in in different keys especially ones with accidental you don't have to sit there and think about physically pressing or a note or finding it on on an instrument it just comes out of you if you're trained well enough i agree i agree well most pop tunes are not written in the in the flats and sharps most pop tunes are written in G, D, C, E, A. They just are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some in F. Yesterday is in the key of F. Um, Cat Stevens' uh, Wild World is in the key of F. But most of the Beatles stuff, most were written in E, D, or G. An example, if you will. So this is one of the songs they want me to, uh, this is one of the songs they want me to play at this guy's thing. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly. That's in the key of G. All your life, you were only waiting for this moment to arise. It's easy in the key of G. And they're easy to play in, too. And a lot of their songs are in that key and in D because they're easy to play. Oh, thank you. Really thank lovely. You. That about that one with John. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, anyway. I think it'd be really fun. Like you seem like a really big Beatles person. I think it'd be really fun to get like a few of the guests on the podcast who've been guests before who talk about the Beatles together to talk about the Beatles and just have a Beatles episode. I think that's a good idea. You also, because, because you literally can, I mean, it would take some doing, you can get a performance from different people I, I, I've seen it. I, I'm not quite sure how it's done. You couldn't really probably do it in real time because there's a little bit of a delay. So if we were all going to play Blackbird, 
you know, someone in Houston, someone in LA, me here, and have like five of us all play Blackbird at the same time and try and keep it in time. I don't know if it would work. I have seen artists do that, but I think there was a lot of production that went into it. Mm. But I'm with you. I mean, it'd just be nice to have people on and and talk about them. And we could all have a different instrument and play a little bit of one of our favorite Beatles songs. Now you got a show. Oh, that would be so fun. I already have a couple of people in mind. Yeah, that would be fun. We'll book it, Steve. We'll book it. Done. I got the pianos right here, guitars right here. I don't do anything except swivel my chair. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and it swivels so well. <laughs> Thank you. It's a fine little swiveler. Do you know the song in my life? I do. I love it. Oh, you do know it. Yes. There are places I'll remember all my life, though some have changed. That's one of the best songs they ever wrote, in my opinion. It's a good one. What are, what are your top three favorite Beatles songs? That's one of them. Yeah, In My Life, uh, maybe She's Leaving Home. Uh, there's just too many. They're, they're different types. Um, Mother Nature's Son is a beautiful song. I, I got 50 songs I could say. I really like that one. But those two, I think She's Leaving Home is a, a great song. And In My Life is a very simple song, but it's they're using elements that they used all the time they and and stevie wonder and i'm thinking and elton john use sevenths a lot to mm. make things work by by going from here to going and then going to the seventh and then going to minors major to minor they did that all the time uh and that was the first pop group i heard that that was changing from major to minor mode in the middle of a song because most pop acts didn't think quite that sophisticatedly and they say in a major mode or minor but they constantly switching back and forth uh that's kind of what partly what makes paul mccartney the songwriter is and really thought outside of the box a lot anyway those, those three i'll go with she's leaving home in my life and i don't know tax man's a great song drive my car is a great song too many what I will do, I should do this for you. It's, you it sounds like you're somewhat of a Beatle fan. Somewhat. <laughs> there's there's like a handful of songs that I really, really love. Right. But I bet you don't really know their catalog that well. Not so much. Okay. And not everything they did was terrific. There's, I'm sure you hear some songs that go, eh, it's okay. But there are a lot of really, really good songs between, you know, they only made so many albums. They were only together so long. I mean, they started, I think the first album came out in 62 by 1970. They're done. They're, they're, they're finished. Uh, couldn't get along. Yoko was a big pain in the butt. And, and, you know, John, and, uh, John and Paul were not getting along. George felt disrespected because they didn't let, they didn't have him do enough writing for them. So anyway, Towards the end, they kind of ran out of ideas. When they got to the the album "Let It Be," it was kind of it was it was not the greatest stuff. But there are f like five albums that are just chock full of great songs, uh, and you should write these down. Write these down. You ready? Yeah. Rubber Soul, without question. Revolver, without question. That includes Eleanor Rigby, which is one of the best pop songs ever written. So Rubber Soul, Revolver, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, full of great songs, and Help, the soundtrack of the movie Help. So those four, just those four albums, if you listen to those four, and next time we talk, you might say, you know what? I heard some really good stuff I'd never heard before, but you're right. Really simple, really good pop tunes, and a couple of kind of sophisticated, really good pop tunes. So just those four. And there, there are others. A lot of people like Abbey Road. It's got a bunch of cool stuff, but you start with those four. That's the foundation of their their canon of pop music, if you will. If I may I, use the canon in such a way. Of and course, I do. Of course. <laughs> I am familiar with quite a, a lot of, I mean, a lot of their music, but not like a lot, you know, just, right. just you know, the hits, essentially, mm -hmm. in, a, in a few B-sides, so to speak. Because of what I do, you know, for music therapy, there's right. tons of Beatles fans who are patients and clients and things like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, start with those. <clears throat> so before I forget, I probably should tell you about this project. I want to tell you about it. Of course. Tumbleweed Connection. Two things that are interesting. There, and I'm, I'm going off the path a little bit. There's a, a festival here in 
Appleton that has become well known now because Rolling Stone did an article on it. They've been talking about it. It's called the Milan Music Festival. It's not necessarily my bag. It's mostly Americana stuff, but they get like 600 acts from all over the country come to little Appleton, Wisconsin in August to do the Mila Music Festival. And it's called Mila Music because it's held on College Avenue and it's about two miles long and there are performances like every five feet, there's a venue or something. In any event, about five years ago, we used to interview the different artists for the, the radio station. So we plant down at a place called Copper Rock Coffee Company, and we would schedule, you know, and hey, sitting in with us right now, hey, hey, Jamie Kent's here. Jamie, this is your fourth Mile of Music Festival. What have you been doing? You got a new album out, blah, 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 stuff like that. So anyway, five years ago, I, one of the artists I met, I actually bothered to go and listen to, and she was much different from a lot of the other artists, to, to my ear. Beautiful voice, but she didn't over sing. And a great instrument, but it was obvious from her writing that she had listened to a lot of Joni Mitchell and a lot of Sean Colvin. Mm. Uh, the chord changes were different. There were different tunings to the guitar, which, which gives you a very different sound. She was really good. And I've become, there's a, there's a performance arts center in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, which is about 45 minutes south of where I live. Um, there's not much down in Fond du Lac, but they have this really beautiful little museum called the Thelma Sadoff Center for the Arts. And it's it's artwork, but it's also two or three performance areas. They do concerts down there. So the music thing is important. For whatever reason they had, which we we have not figured out yet, they asked me to be a board member. So I said, really? You couldn't find anyone else? Me. <laughs> I'm like the last person I put on a board of anything. But in any event, I was flattered they asked. Um, because I'd done a couple of concerts there and they figured maybe they're local talent that I can suggest or whatever the reason was. So I told them uh, there's a girl named Katie Boeck who you should definitely get here. And I bet we could afford her and get her into town. The reason I'm telling you this is she is going to do a concert. Uh, at, we, we booked her for the Thelma Sadoff. She's going to do a concert on, on October 20th and it's Joni Mitchell's entire album blue. Now people that are Joni Mitchell fans know that album. That's where, you know, River came from and A Case of You and all these like that, you know, people hear these songs, and they cry. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, this is my my childhood listening to Joni's Blue album, because it was the one that really kind of took her from this talented folk singer that people knew to holy mackerel. This is the real deal. So she's going to do the entire Blue album start to finish, plus some of her own songs. And she plays piano and guitar and she knows the voicings. And I'm leading to something. I know I'm. I'm rambling but she has these different tunings on the guitar for these songs because Joni Mitchell had to learn different tunings for her guitar because when Joni Mitchell was like 14 years old she got polio and it basically crippled her left hand and it turned it like this so she couldn't she couldn't finger the chords properly that you're supposed to on a guitar make a d chord a g chord whatever it is her hand was like this and when she moved from Canada to the United States, one of the first people she met was David Crosby. And David Crosby said, I'm going to show you a bunch of alternate tunings so that you can play your songs and all you have to do is slide one or two fingers over the, over the, the strings. You won't have to do individual fingerings. And that's where she got her sound from. So Joni used like 40 different tunings on her guitar and Katie has learned to do that so she sounds exactly like it. And now I'll get to the main point of my story which is connected to the Thelma Sadoff Center, which is down in Fond du Lac, which I, like I said, I'm a board member. 1970, as it turns out, was a very iconic year for pop rock albums. It just happened to turn out that way. I'm sure very good albums came out in 72 and 78 and 85, but, but 1970 was McCartney's first solo album. It was Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young's first album, Deja Vu. It was Joni Mitchell's Ladies of the Canyon, Van Morrison's Moon Dance, um, James Taylor's Sweet Baby James, uh, Elton John's First Out, it, all these George Harrison's All Things Must Pass, these really well-known pop albums came out in 1970. And one of the albums that came out was Elton John's Tumbleweed Connection. And for those of us of my ilk who listened to him at the time, uh, and a lot of music critics thought he's uh, still feel he's never surpassed it. That it's such a brilliant album and the concept of it was 
His writing partner is a guy named Bernie Taupin, who writes all the lyrics for Elton's songs. Elton doesn't write one, one word of lyrics. Uh, Bernie writes all the lyrics, Elton writes the music. And when Elton John came to Los Angeles to do what is now a very, very well-known famous uh, stint at the Troubadour in West Hollywood, nobody had heard of Elton John yet. And he did this show at the Troubadour, which is a small place. It seats maybe 175. And they had a bunch, bunch of industry people there. And he just blew the roof off the place. No one had ever heard of Elton John. And they heard this guy like, holy smokes. And he recorded his first album, which included already a standard, which is called Your Song. You know, it's a little bit funny. Well, first album, that song's never going to go away. So for the second album, which he recorded the same year, he and Bernie are back in England. And Bernie Taupin was rather taken with um, the band called The Band, Robbie mm. Robertson's band. Yeah, yeah. Which it was Bob Dylan's band, but Robbie Robertson and, and Levon Helm and all those guys, Canadians, put together the band. And Bernie heard that album, Music from Big Pink, their first album, uh, which has, you know, Take a Load Off Annie, Take a Loan for Free, all these songs that people know from the band. Bernie was taken with it. He said, I really like this whole Americana style of writing. It's just interesting. And he and Elton decided for their second album, after, you know, having this first hit album, we're going to write basically a, a country Americana opera, basically. It, it, it's not done like an opera, but it's all the songs are about the Old West. It's all about cowboys and rustlers and preachers in the Old West and, 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 and gunslingers. They had never been to the States. They'd never been to the, to, the, to the West. It was all from just reading and listening to Robert Robertson. So anyway, they put together this album called Tumbleweed Connection. And it's just, it's a phenomenal album. The songs are great. This is before, you know, this is the pre-Benny and the Jets, um, you know, Rocket Man stuff, which is fine. But these songs are so much more organic. And, and you listen to them and go, wow. Wow. And literally, we that bought that album, we all had it on vinyl. We wore it out. It's just, I've got two copies because it, it, we wore it out. It's that good. And it has songs on it you would know. You would say, oh, I didn't know that was from that. But oh, okay, yeah, I've heard that song. So make an extremely long story shorter, hopefully. My friend Michael Murphy, who's in my band Steam with me, who's 21 years old. And he's, he's one of those whiz musicians, can sing, play everything, smart I said, do you know the Tumbleweed Connection? He goes, well, of course. I go, how would you, you're 21. How would you know this? <laughs> you know, he goes, oh, please. Great. Love that album. I said, why don't we do a concert of the whole album? Because there are strings on it. There are horns on it. There are background singers on it. There's a band on it. I said, let's do the entire album. First note to last. He said, I'm in. Let, let's do it. So we've been rehearsing. Well, we've got rehearsals next week for it. We are going to do that at the Thelma Sadoff the week before Katie comes in. So October 13th and 14th. We're doing this concert called Tumbleweed Reconnection. Oh, and nice. The whole first half of the concert is that album. And then the second half of the concert are other songs that people know from 1970, because that album came out in 1970. So it's Chicago and James Taylor and Janice Ian and the James Gang and McCartney and all these songs that people will know. You know, Maybe I'm Amazed. They all came out in 1970. So it's going to be a, a huge labor of love to put this together but no one's doing a concert like this no one's doing tumbleweed connection all the way through and i have the musicians that are good enough to recreate this so it really sounds like oh my gosh they're pulling it off so that's the big project i've been working on besides going down and singing at this guy's wake and doing the jazz festival i'm wearing a lot of musical hats and fortunately i think i can do it or i wouldn't even try so that's what's going on i'm sorry very long-winded way of answering your Nice question 30 minutes ago. Say, what have you been up to? So that's it. And I will send you, I will email you the original album cover of Tumbleweed Connection and our poster because we decided to recreate it as best we could. Oh, that's so it, cool. It was shot at a train station in England. So we had to try and figure out how do we make something here to look like that? So I'll, I'll send it to you and see what you think. It definitely sounds like you've kept yourself busy for sure. Well, yeah, otherwise, you know, I'm in trouble. Otherwise, I had s some kid, there's a kid. <laughs> my, my daughter has, uh, they're all theater kids. All, you know, my, my two daughters, they, all, they hang out with musical theater kids. And one of them has a brother who's a little bit older than they are. He's, he's 20, really nice kid. And I found out that he plays tennis. 
So I said, oh, you and I should play some tag. Just, oh, I'd love to. That'd be fun. So we've played tennis twice now. And the second time we played, he said, so what did you, so what did you do before you retired? I, I was like. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I said, well, I'll never retire. I said, that's just not going to happen. I, I, this is all I can do. I said, I, I sing for a living. That's how I make, I make my money entertaining on a stage or on the radio or whatever. And, I, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean I said, I get it. That's fine. Not everybody knows who the heck I am. So I certainly understand that. Um, but I said, no, I'm, I'm not retired. So I figured, you know, at this point you'd be retired. I go, no, afraid not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't socked away enough money and I still have too many more projects to do. But mm. he's a really sweet kid. And it was fun playing tennis with him. That's cute. So last time we talked a little bit about the creative process, but as of course you embark on new projects and try new things, and you were recently talking about your Tumbleweed Reconnection concert, do you find that each new project, does it change or tweak your creative process at all? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to learn music that's already been written, that that will spark, you know, my saying, you know what, these are really good songs, but I also think that I write good songs. I I haven't written any while. Let's should get down. Let's let's put some more original material. As a matter of fact, we got this kid Michael Murphy, who I mentioned to you that I'm gonna do the concert with. We're basically splitting the 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 lead parts uh because he's that good. Um we're gonna write a new song for the Christmas show too. Oh nice. We we have our song I Remember Christmas Time, which is you know very sentimental and lovely tune. I'm really happy with it. But we're gonna write uh, kind of a more up-tempo pop tune for this next series of shows. Just so we have another piece of original material that pe people have not heard at holiday time. So yeah, so it does spark it. The, the interesting thing for me is learning how to play these songs because I'm not school taught. I'm almost completely taught by ear. So mm -hmm. my piano playing and my guitar playing, I've never taken a piano lesson. I did take some guitar lessons as a kid, but it's mostly I can hear and, and collate, but learning some of the the voicings, this 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 Elton John album, and learning how to play all these songs on the piano. I don't have his proficiency, but I can play well enough that it's like, oh yeah, okay, that song. And you know, hearing stuff, hearing stuff on on record and pulling out, going, what is what is he playing there? Why does that not sound right? Why is it not quite right? And realizing, okay, your root was a little bit different. He has a certain way of voicing chords using. Instead of using the root on a chord, he'll often use the third as the root. Mm. And it gives it that kind of gospely, churchy sound. So when he's playing, for instance, like, like G, the second time the G will be this. So that it gets that leading tone of the B into the C in the bass. It, 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 there's a lot of that kind of gospel sound is on that album. And unless you can hear it, you're not going to play the right chords. You're going to play the dummy chords. Like, well, yeah, well, it sounded like a G to me. No, it's a G over B. That's what you're supposed to be playing. So that's the nice challenge for me is learning how to play all these songs that I heard years and years ago, but I never bothered to learn them because I didn't have to. Yeah. So that, that's a nice challenge for me. I, I, it's nice to know that I haven't lost everything up here yet. Because trust me, I, like many people, put down a set of keys and go, where are my keys? I put them down two seconds ago. Where are my keys? So <laughs> that, that kind of stuff happens and you're supposed to make a phone call and oh, I forgot to write that down, but I know that I can still learn stuff. So that's, that's encouraging. You know, when the kid said, what, what did you do since you retired? That's why I said, I can't retire. I still have to learn stuff. So. Right. Yeah. And that's the beauty of music though. It, it literally helps with like elasticity in your brain. It keeps you young. Absolutely true. Yeah. In fact, that should be, for people that are dealing with that, they're dealing with the, you know, the onset of, of Alzheimer's or dementia, it wouldn't be the worst idea for a project to be, I, I need to learn how to play a song. Mm -hmm. Even if it's the most simple song in the world, if they got a piano at home or a guitar, teach themselves how to do it. Just, you're right, to keep the elasticity and the synapse still firing. Mm -hmm. so, not a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. What I mean, what what do you mostly what is your basic method for the work that you do um, when you're working with people? Yeah. Well, I actually work in a, for a hospice and palliative company. So many of my patients um, have late stage Alzheimer's or they have uh, non Alzheimer's dementia or some have Parkinson's or cancer, but 
You know, it, it really depends on the patient. Everything is, of course, patient-centered and patient-directed. But there's a lot of singing for emotional expression and, um, you know, using instruments for fine and gross motor um, groups for, for socialization and, and, you know, keeping keeping their spirits up in that way, you know, doing music groups and things like that and and um, just exploring music and playing music as well and from a cognitive standpoint, cognitive stimulation, or, or even for some people, just music for relaxation, you know, me singing mm-hmm. to them or creating mm-hmm. uh, curated playlists, things like that. So, Well, there's enough, there's enough anxiety in the world more now than ever. So, you know, it, music's, one, it's, it's a cliche, but it's true. It's like, it's why they bring cats into hospitals and to people with dementia and you, you sit a cat on someone's lap and they start purring, boy, does it change things? Mm-hmm. All of a sudden they're like, and they, they're connecting up again. You know, someone who's been staring out a window for, for three years, you bring a, a, a cat or, or a little puppy in there, all of a sudden things change. It's the same thing with music. Literally the vibrations that music makes it affects people emotionally. There's no question about it. You, know, you hear a sad song, you hear something out, you know, like out of West Side Story and you get tears in your eyes you don't need to see it. You literally can, uh, you know, I'm not telling anything you don't know. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the amazing thing about music. It really does affect people emotionally and very few things do. Computers don't. Buying milk doesn't, but uh, music, music does that. It does. I'd have, I'd, have no, I'd have no way to make a living. In, in addition to the Beatles, what other music influences influenced you not only in the past and, and what are, who has influenced you recently music wise? recently i'm trying to think of what's influenced me i don't know if anything recently has really influenced me i listen to because i do that radio station i do listen to a lot more music than i probably would have normally because i I need to find out what these people sound like so i'm not just an an automated voice saying and that was mumford and sons and next so i do listen and i you know I, i if i hear something i really really like i will point out and say oh interesting production on that that the remake they did of that or the way this person writes. So I don't know that I've been influenced by the stuff I'm listening to, but I do keep my ears open. And, you know, somebody who did an album two years ago, who I kind of liked as an artist, he had a reputation of being um, an extremely difficult human being to work with, uh, was David Crosby. Uh, You know, the reason that David Crosby and Graham Nash didn't talk for the last three or four years of David Crosby's life because basically Graham just said, I, I just can't put up with him anymore. I just, you know, he's just too nasty a human being, too unpleasant, too unreliable. But he put out an album two years ago called For Free, which is the, um, it's one of Joni Mitchell's songs. Mm-hmm. And it's a great album. I mean, it's really great. And one of the reasons is that David Crosby gave a kid up for adoption a million years ago and never found him, never connected with him, no idea where he was. And he found him about 20 years ago. And I, it's hard for me to believe it's that long ago, but my friend brought me an album. He said, have you heard this? It was a group called CPR, which uh, stood for Crosby, um, Pivar, uh, Raymond. And it turns out David Crosby had a kid. He found him, a kid named James Raymond. He was working in Hollywood scoring movies and he's a great writer and, and, hip as hell, writes really interesting chord changes. I mean, Steely Dan kind of chord changes, like, wow. Well, his signature's all over this album. It's really, really good, called For Free. And, you know, David Crosby died about five or six months ago, but fortunately had this last album. So that kind of influenced me. There's some great songs on it. I'm sure that I'll hear some stuff by Take Six that will influence me again on Saturday because their harmony. Have you ever heard Take Six? I I've bet heard you have. of them, but not okay. heard them. Yeah. Even if you heard the very first cut from their very first album, very first one, and just listen to the whole first song all the way through, you would say, so that's what Steve was talking about. Because there are lots of, you know, people that can sing harmonies. That's not a big secret, but not like this and not this kind of arranging. They're, the density of the, the, the passing tones in their chords literally go, you go like, <laughs> Just you just feel it. So just listen to the very first cut in their very first album. But just look up take six. Um, yeah, in fact, give me half a second here. Half a second. These are the guys that I'm gonna see on who I'm gonna be opening up for 
on Saturday. This is the very first album. And now this is a remake, a remake of it. It's the same album. They just reissued it. Mm -hmm. And now it's called, of course, classic album. I got it when they first came out. And the first song is called Goldmine. So just listen to Goldmine and you let me know what you think. That's all. Okay. Okay. Well, Fair done. I, I've got all my listening homework here. <laughs> not, not much, a little bit. I mean, you got, yeah, four Beatle albums, but listen to Goldmine, <laughs> listen to Goldmine first. So you get an idea of what I'm going to be hearing on, on, on Saturday. Now, these boys are out of, out of the South, I think originally out of Nashville and they were all church going boys, very religious. And the first time I heard the album and my friend said, how can you listen to that with all the religion? I said, I'm not even, I'm, I'm, there don't, there don't have to be any words. Mm -hmm. I said, just what they're singing. I said, just hearing that. I mean, you know, my dad, my, my dad, you know, knew an awful lot about harmony and about uh, groups like this, the high lows who are a very famous acapella group. He heard this first time and said, wow. I said, yep. And the first time I saw them, they opened up for Mel Torme at the Hollywood Bowl. Mm -hmm. So how that circle has come full, they open up for him. I'm opening up for them at the Oshkosh Jazz Festival. That's so cool. Yeah, the, the, the circles, they never surprise me these days. Indeed. So pretty cool. Yeah. Speaking of harmonies, I'm a huge fan of uh, like Renaissance music because the har the pure harmonies from back then, like Palestrina and things like that are just and they're amazing. Natural. They mm -hmm. come naturally. People that, that my daughters both have it, especially my, my eldest. Some people just naturally can sing harmonies. They hear that's what they hear when they hear a lead. They're not even hearing the lead. They're immediately hearing the third and the fifth and the sixth. Uh, and you're right. Renaissance music. There's lots of great harmonies, classic stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need, you need to learn how to play a lute. I think. There you go. I can play the ukulele, but it's not the same as a lute, but they're related. <laughs> I can make that jump. I can make that leap. There, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter Ruby picked up the ukulele and, and in about two days she was playing songs. I said, really? Just, yeah, yeah, but playing minor chords. And, yeah, she's she's a scary talent. Oh, yeah, pretty good. Are I'm you guys going to be doing uh, concerts together? I know I know last Christmas you guys did a song together. They both girls are going to sing the song with me um, at the Fox Cities Performing Arts Center. Uh, and we've changed the arrangement. Uh, we had one from last year, which I really like. It was um, a little challenging for our keyboard player because my keyboard player in LA wrote the arrangement and she's just not the lady here who plays with us is not all that used to some of the jazz voicings and it never really sounded quite right. So we've changed it a little bit and we've added, it's basically the, the version partly that the Carpenters did and that my dad did with Judy Garland on a TV special. So we've added a beginning and we've added a little ending that are kind of different from the traditional and it'll be a lot easier for the girls to sing it with me, but we've, three-part harmony on it it's gonna sound great oh so, nice yeah i'm looking forward to it uh they're not going to travel around with us because they're only singing one song but the fox city's performing arts center is here in appleton so you know mom can drive them there and go back home so <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll sound great excellent excellent are they still big taylor swift fans oh god <laughs> it's all i hear i mean that's really especially the younger ones but they both know all of her songs and of course she's got that you know, concert tour this year, which is making ten billion dollars, uh, and is playing all over the place. And some of their friends have gone to see Taylor. I think a couple of them saw them in Los, saw her in Los Angeles, and I'm sure they're looking at me going, well, "Well, when do we get to go?" I'm saying, "Well, when when Dad sells off one of you, so we can afford to." You know, <laughs> which, pick pick which one can't live here anymore. Just let me know. So I know they want to go see her. I, I think she's going to be down maybe in Milwaukee, probably down in Chicago is as close as they're going to get to here. We'll see. But they, yeah, they both love her. They love her songs. There you go. I've got a sister that lives in Palm Desert and they just got hit with that Hurricane Hillary yesterday. Oh gosh. That's the tough. The Palm Desert swamped. It's, it's, it's completely, they got, they said three months of rainwater in one day. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So everything's, everything's washed out. I mean, it's a desert, but it's now it's mud and the golf courses and everything. They're completely underwater. So that's, that's kind of a drag. I talked to her yesterday and yeah, just, it's crazy time. I have friends in Hawaii. They didn't mm -hmm. live in China. Thank, thank goodness. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. People that keep saying 
Climate change is a hoax. Really? Have you turned on your television lately? Yep. Yep. Heat waves, fire, hurricanes. Yeah. Yes. It's, not a, it's not a happy it's time. A, no, and it's not a coincidence. It's not like, oh, they're just happening. It just, it just kind of happened. No, no, that's not why they're happening. The, the temperature of the planet has heated up. And it's causing more havoc. That's how it works. People don't want to talk about it. I, I get it. I don't know, climate change, we'll figure it out. No, we're not going to figure it out. You know, my kids, kids, kids might not be a great place to come into. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll keep doing concerts and try and make people happy. Yeah. <laughs> In our yeah. own small little way. <laughs> of course, of course. You know, speaking of travel, of course, right now is not a great time to travel. But is there any place that you've always wanted to do a concert and you've not had a chance to? Yeah, I mean, I've done some shows in places I wanted to go to, but I'd, I'd like to do more shows. I mean, I've, I've played in London. I don't know if I would call it a concert. I played in three clubs there. So I'd like to do a concert there. Played at a hotel in Hawaii. It was fun to do so. I'd like to do a concert there. I don't know. I, I you know, I took the, we, we went to Paris last year because I sang on a, on a riverboat, on a riverboat cruise. Now, that's not exactly what my desire was, but it got us to Paris. Um, do I want to sing in front of a Parisian audience? I don't know. I want to sing anywhere. So, no, I can't really think of anywhere that I, I, I haven't gone that I want to. I sang in Japan, but that was a whole different project. Mm -hmm. I was part of a trio. I wouldn't mind going back there and doing a jazz concert. They love jazz. Mm -hmm. And they loved Mel Torme. So I could go back and do a Torme Sings Torme tribute concert with the 10 pieces, and they would eat it up. Just need a promoter to do it. So... Hmm. that'd be fun i'm i think i'm going back to um vegas uh probably in november a guy talked to me about coming and doing that particular concert he said could you do that tribute concert to your dad i said yeah but you know it's i said there are plenty of musicians in las vegas i know enough that it, that would not be an issue but it's a 10-piece band he goes oh you know the venue we're talking about we, we're, we're trying to do something special there we do a gala every year and only seats like 200 people i you know i don't think we could afford a 10-piece band i said well I can do it with a trio, but it won't be the same show. I said, yeah, but I can pull it off. I, you know, I can do it with a trio, but I can't do all the same songs. They don't work for a trio necessarily like they would for 10 pieces. And he said, no, let's do that. So I haven't sung in Switzerland. I'd like to sing in Switzerland. That would be nice. And then get some really good chocolates, right? And, and at least another watch. Yeah. Or perhaps a watch made out of chocolate. Now we're talking. There you go. There you go. <laughs> You know, speaking of uh, current artists, are you familiar with Melody Gardot? Well, Melody Gardot, um, who we know was a busker. That's how she started out. She was busking, I forgot where, I think in Europe. And do you know her background? Yeah, she got hit like right. by a car. Yeah, she was, I think, bicycling. Yeah. Either bicycling or walking, got hit by a car and a horrific accident. And, you know, left her with all, you know, migraines and all kinds of bad stuff and and can she can perform again um she was one of the first artists that i was introduced to on the avenue we started playing her stuff and i kind of did some research on her and she's out doing concerts again and apparently it's quite good but it, it was like a long time of recovery do you have her stuff do you listen to her stuff oh i love her stuff she's one of my favorites yeah yeah do you ever play any of her songs yeah, well, why well, I, I haven't, but we play them on 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 the radio station. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could look into a catalog, see if any of them would make sense for me. I don't. Know. So. They're they're really cool, um, but I mean, but hard she's almost like a jazz chanteuse, you know. Yeah, so yeah. She fits in a very niche category, but mm -hmm. she's good at it. You know, she's she's really good at it. Definitely, definitely. And you know, speaking of chord changes, she's got some really interesting voices and voicings and chord changes as as well. That's something that I've really drawn to in, in her music she has a song we, we play called sweet memory mm -hmm. if i'm not mistaken yeah i think there's two or three songs of hers that we that we played i'll delve a little bit more into you know listen to some of her albums you know i, I it's always nice to hear new stuff yeah yeah she just came out with one called entre deux with um it's just her and i want to th i think his name is like philippe powell or um and, and the pianist and so it's just those, it's just piano and her and occasionally strings. And it's just really cool. It's really cool. Okay. 
Yeah. I, I will listen. I'm, I'm sure she's quite fluent in, in French, isn't she? Mm. I, I would think so. Mele de Gardo. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have a chance to do too many quirky questions last time, but I was curious, what would you bring to a potluck? Are we talking food? Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to a, a kitten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would I bring to a potluck? Now, that's a good question. I mean, I would try to stay away from the obvious stuff, you know, wings and try and come up with something a little more interesting. What would I bring to a potluck? Well, I wouldn't do it, but it'd be fun to bring a, a bunch of artichokes with melted butter because not enough people eat those. And a lot of people never had an artichoke, but it's such a different thing to have and they're kind of fun, but maybe that's a little too eclectic because not everyone's gonna like the taste of that. Maybe a, maybe a pizza with pineapple and ham on top. Not everybody likes that either. Maybe a pizza with anchovies. Not everybody likes that, but I do. But you can't go wrong bringing dessert. If True. you bring dessert, everyone's going to love you. True. So bring dessert. Brownies, whatever. Anything that's sweet. People go, oh, yeah, thanks for bringing that. We just did this last night. We had a, we had a for kids from 1 to 92 meeting last night that was basically a potluck. It's exactly what it was. It was the whole band getting together to talk about how can we make the holiday shows even better this year? What can we do to tighten them up? Blah, 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 blah. And they said, you know, everybody bring something. And we had more than enough food last night. Uh, <laughs> burgers, brats, um, sweet corn that was roasted on a grill, mm. uh, wings, all kinds of salads, all kinds of desserts, just way more than was necessary. So that was fun. Nice. That sounds great. So you guys, you guys are getting the ball rolling. Well, I guess the holidays will be here any minute now. And that's a big show. That's got a yeah. lot of music and it really needs to be coordinated. We can't just get up and wing that. It, it, just too many moves. So yeah, we'll start, start working on it now and decide what we're going to add to the show. I know we're adding at least one more song, which means we'll probably take one out. And it's also been a year since we've done it. So we have to really rehearse. There's a lot of stuff to remember. Mm -hmm. So by the time, because you also work at a radio station, by the time you get to the holidays, are you like really tired of hearing holiday music? Yes. <laughs> yeah. By the second day of the holiday season, I've heard all the songs. Okay, great. Oh, look, here's someone else's version of Let It Snow. Oh, wonderful. Oh, here's, <laughs> look, <laughs> you, know, it, you know, Bruce Springsteen's version of Winter Wonderland. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. Don't care. Don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever played that game where you have to go as long as you can without hearing last christmas no is, is that a game yeah apparently like the idea is to see how long into the holiday season before you hear last christmas um which okay people don't usually last very long <laughs> um well now it would be the, Mar the mariah carey tune it was it all i want for christmas is, is you, you yeah I mean, that's going to come on immediately. I think it's the I think it's the all time biggest Christmas hit now, which is really unbelievable. I mean, the biggest Christmas, the most popular Christmas song for a million years was "White Christmas." Bing Crosby's everybody's everybody knows the song. It's played every year a million times. Then, like second to that, was my dad's song. The Christmas song was second. Everybody knows. Well, first of all, I can't think of any other song ever written in the history of mankind that starts with the word chestnuts. So that's <laughs> a good place to start. But now it's her song. Uh, da, 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 that's that's played the most now. It is huh? really catchy. Yeah. Song. Absolutely. Really catchy. It's yeah. on our show. We, we do it. it. It's fun when one of the girls sings that one and I get to sing backgrounds on it and do stupid dancing. So fun. <laughs> I'm going to have to come to a show just to see you do stupid Oh, dancing. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Maybe if you, maybe if you and I both end up in New York. We'll see. There you go. I don't see this. I don't see this show coming down to Houston anytime soon, but you never know. It's hard. It's hard to get into the Christmas spirit when it's like 98 degrees out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do. Yep. yep. Yeah, you need to get to New York where Christmas is pretty cool. That would be neat. Well, one last question. Okay. If you could bring any artist musician author creative person back from the grave who would it be well that's a really good question morbid but good it is i could give a real smart ass answer and say well elton john oh he's still alive uh, no, see, that's <laughs> that's too easy that's too easy 
Willie Nelson. Oh, oh, he's still alive. Never mind. What musician? Wow, that's a great question. Well, bring him back for what purpose? To continue making music? Or to talk to, perhaps? All because of the above, of anything. What yeah, stories really. they have, right? Yeah. Um, well, I think it might be John Lennon. I mean, you're going to get all these stories. They knew everybody. They were the most famous group in the entire world. There's got to be a billion stories. Mm-hmm. That's, that's who I think I would choose. I mean, I hate to be such a Beatle file, but that's that's the person whose stories I'd want to hear. Now, maybe maybe Sinatra, because it's same for the same reason. You're going to get stories that are going to be quite different from the Beatles stories. You're going to hear a lot of mafia stories and and crazy stuff and people he was with. But I think I think Lennon would be more entertaining. Mm-hmm. He had a real smart ass, you know, pretty wise sense of humor. I think he'd be fun to hang out with. Excellent. Well, Steve, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, listeners, check out the show notes to check Steve on tour, not only for his 1 to 92 show at the holidays, but for all of the really cool appearances he's going to be doing throughout the year. Yeah, they, they go to my web my website. You just go to stevemarchtorme.com. Simple as that. Uh, also my Facebook page, because I put stuff on there all the time. I'll be promoting the jazz festival as soon as we get off their, our podcast. So they, they can find me at both those places. Perfect. Excellent. Well, Steve, thanks always. And listeners, keep rocking. Well, thank you. Thanks for doing this again. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? Stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for a creative piecemeal podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.